Uh, welcome to the uh, inauspicious start to the conference on reproducibility and replicability in economics and social sciences. Um, our goal was with the conference is to provide a, a consistent series of discussions by specialists and practitioners on topics of reproducibility, replicability, transparency, and their intersection with a variety of topics. Over the course of the next year, we'll have panels discussing educational and procedural barriers, slowing down adoption of uh, reproducible methods, whether journals or institutions or funders should be the verifiers of reproducibility, whether and how scientists' work can be made to be reproducible at every stage of the research process, including at the inception and data collection stage, and implications of all of the above for the training of undergraduates and graduate students, and in many cases of continuing education for researchers in the field. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Alex Mishuda, who you still see on, on screen, who's my co-PI on this and host of some of the future webinars. Um, Marie Connolly is uh, off screen, is one of my co-organizers, and Ian Schmidt, who can make it today, is another one of those. Um, and finally, <laughs> Sarah Brooks, who is off screen, who keeps the wheels rolling. Um, Alex and Sarah will be manning the QA. Uh, and relay any questions that you type in there uh, to us panelists. Uh, so please uh, ask questions all throughout the webinar. Uh, we'll have uh, explicitly time at the end to uh, address uh, all those questions. Uh, so today's webinar, uh, we're starting off with is uh, on the topic, on the general topic of institutional support with a specific question, should journals verify reproducibility? Uh, so we're looking forward to hearing from our expert panelists and to your questions. Um, We'll have about 40 minutes of discussion uh, by and amongst the panelists, um, and then we'll turn to audience questions. Uh, so again, to submit a question, please type it into the QA, and we will ask your quest the question on your behalf uh, to the speakers. Without further ado, let me introduce our panelists. Uh, today, we're joined um, by three panelists. Um, First off, uh, Reed Imbens, uh, Professor of Economics at the School of Humanities and Sciences, Senior Fellow at the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research, Coulter Family Faculty Fellow at Stanford University, and relevant for this particular uh, discussion, Editor of Econometrica. Um, also joining us is Tim Salmon, Professor of Economics at Southern Methodist University, and the Editor of Economic Inquiry, which is the one of the journals of the Western Economic Association. And finally, uh, Tony Whitehead, uh, Dale Daikima, Professor of business, business Administration at the Ross School of Business at the University of Michigan, and relevant for this discussion, Editor of the Journal of Financial Economics. Finally, my name is Lars Villehuber. Um, I'm um, Executive Director of the Labor Dynamics Institute uh, at Cornell's ILR School, and for this discussion, relevant Data Editor of the Eight Journals of the American Economic Association. I'll be the moderator, so I'll let our panelists talk. And with that, I'll turn it over to Guido, who will start. Thanks, uh, Lars. Uh, thanks very much <coughs> for having me on this, uh, this panel. Um, to be honest, when I started as editor three years ago, replication policies were not something I had really given uh, a lot of thought uh, to. However, in the last couple of years, I've, I've been convinced that both that this is a very important issue for the profession as a whole, but also that journal, the journals can and really should make a difference uh, here. And the AA, of course, has shown a great deal of leadership here. And at the Econometric Society, we've been uh, happy to free ride so far. But now, and we will continue to kind of draw on the experience of the, the AEA data editor team that uh, Lars has been leading, but we'll be more proactive uh, in this area. And we're going to also insist on replicating all papers in, uh, in Econometrica and the other uh, Econometric Society journals prior to publication. And we'll, we'll soon be hiring a data editor to take charge of that. And while it'll take us a while to, to get to the point that we do as good a job as the AA journals, then by the end of, uh, of the three years that I have left in my term as editor, I hope and expect that uh, we'll, we will be reproducing all empirical papers uh, that we published, uh, at least the ones uh, without confidential data. Exactly how we deal with confidential data uh, is not completely clear to me at the moment, but we'll probably try to follow what the AA is doing there 
in that respect, but at least for the publicly available data, for papers with publicly available data, we will make sure that the numbers do reproduce prior to uh, full acceptance of the paper prior to publication. And so the one reason I think this is really important is that uh, I see the role of journals these days not so much as disseminating the papers uh, that can easily be done by the authors themselves by posting on their own websites or by posting on archive type uh, websites. Instead, what, what the journals do is really give the paper some stamp of approval. And we do that by having reviewers read the papers and evaluate them. But kind of traditionally, the reviewers focus only on the theoretical arguments and the, and the reported results. They may ask authors to do an additional analysis, but they don't really check those. And when we publish papers, we essentially say that we think the theoretical results are both interesting and, and correct. And that still may not always pan out. And we sometimes need to publish corrections, but at least there kind of there's, there's a clear uh, hope and a plan that, that the published theoretical results are correct. But traditionally, we don't really question the validity of the numbers in a paper in a paper at all. And given that now the technology is there to actually do that, there's no reason to also say a publication that we think the empirical results in the paper are correct, at least kind of in the limited sense that they, they follow from the data and the code that the, the authors have produced. And so I think we, we should do that. We ought to do that. And not doing that is, is really a dereliction of, our, of a, our duty, given that it's actually possible to do that now. Over time, I would actually like to go further and, and give the reviewers the opportunity to actually get access to the data of all the papers under review, but that, that may be a longer term uh, thing. One additional comment I want to make uh, here is that as more and more journals are following the, the lead of the AEA in this regard, we really need to update how we train graduate students so that they fully understand from the beginning of their graduate student careers that the, any data analysis they do, and any data analysis that they hope to eventually publish needs to be reproducible and documentable, documented and really in a shape that other people can use that and, and build on those uh, on that code. That's not how I was trained when I was in graduate school. That's not how I was trained as an undergraduate. Uh, but in the future, we will need to do that and do that in a way that will improve and streamline the reproducibility process and in general improve the, the quality of the, the empirical work. So I, th I think that we really need to kind of in all the, the graduate programs, make sure that the students understand what is going to be expected of them in the, in the long run whichever way they're going to be doing uh, empirical work. So let me uh, stop here and, and, uh, and let someone else make some comments. And then we'll... Okay, um, thank you, Guido. So next up is uh, Tim. Tim, I think you had a, a small number of slides to share. Um, why don't you start with that? Okay. All right. Uh, well, thank you for inviting me onto the panel. I think this is a uh, very important topic. Coincidentally, I was just lecturing to my uh, undergraduates about it today, so it's uh, fresh on my mind. Um, so uh, I took over as editor of Economic Inquiry a uh, year, year and a half ago, and this issue about um, data requirements and reproducibility was on my mind, and um, it's one of the, I introduced a lot of new policies. This was one of the uh, first ones. So um, what I thought I would talk about is that, you know, yes, I think the journal should verify reproducibility. Um, I'm gonna go quickly through some of the arguments I heard against it, give some of my uh, comments on uh, how I dealt with those arguments and well, then talk about some of the uh, uh, other reasons why I think that it's important to do it. Um, so this, I mean, it is not still not exactly something that everyone agrees on. So it's um, um, worth at least uh, understanding some of those issues. So one of the most common um, objections I got when uh, I was talking to people about whether we should do it is authors being concerned. Well, if you make me post my code and my data, other people can copy my work. Um, my point to that is yes, that's exactly the point. 
Um, once your paper is published, you want people to be able to understand how you did it, uh, why you did it, and to be able to um, um, start from there and go forward. It makes your more work more impactful. Um, and instead of being a negative, I think this is pretty much the idea. Um, it's, uh, it's useful to be able to do it. Um, so it allows people to build off of it, which uh, I think is what we're trying to do as scientists, is try to build some uh, tools, build some science that others can uh, uh, build off of. So I don't see that as a negative. Um, uh, the other common issue I heard that people were concerned about is the degree to which this might place an extra burden on authors and um, that uh, from the journal side that this might decrease submissions as people looking at the requirements might choose to uh, uh, submit elsewhere. Um, and this is definitely an issue uh, in particular for, um, you know, for the a AA journals and for Econometrica, they can require authors to submit on blue polka dot paper with the paper carried in by carrier pigeons and people will still submit. Um, for journals that are in the set of not Econometrica and not AER, it's a legitimate concern that uh, authors might uh, um, not want to satisfy uh, very draconian uh, requirements. So, um, you know, an important point there uh, to uh, uh, echo something that Guido was talking about, if authors learn to do this from the beginning, which they should, then um, complying with these requirements is not a big deal. And if authors begin the project to be reproducible, my view is it's useful for the authors as well. I mean, you know, if you uh, get a revise and resubmit on a paper a year and a half after you've done the work for it, it's useful for yourself to have the scripts to go back and uh, look through. So I, uh, I think it's useful for the authors to begin with. Um, and uh, like I said, it's more of an issue for some journals than others. And I think this is one of the reasons why some journals might make uh, different um, uh, decisions than others. We can talk more about that uh, later. Um, and also another point about uh, what uh, Guido was saying, some people argue that, well, you can uh, satisfy this requirement that any authors who want to make this stuff transparent should be able to do so. They can put the data on their own website. They can host their own uh, repositories which they can, but it doesn't accomplish the goals of what we want with this. Um, so for the goals, in my view, it's necessary to allow for the more rapid and reliable scientific advancement, right? Um, once someone figures out how to do something, it's useful for others to be able to build off of that and progress with it. Uh, having someone else spend a year and a half reinventing the wheel of what someone else did is not always that reliable, right? The point of publishing the papers is to put the work out there so that others can build off of it and uh, having journals uh, verifying that these things work and uh, verifying the methods, I think uh, help with, with that. Um, and the other reason that I really think that journals have to uh, host these things themselves is the importance of this in determining intentional and unintentional fraud, right? I mean, we all know about uh, many cases of intentional fraud of people fabricating data sets or going on gigantic uh, p-hacking and phishing expeditions uh, for the foundation of their paper. This is certainly not something that anyone wants in any reputable journal. Having these requirements at the journal, I think would uh, uh, not only allow you to identify some of this if it's happening, but deter people from doing it to begin with. Um, and so I think uh, it's uh, vital for uh, the integrity of our research to make certain the journals do this. I think it also uh, helps deter what I would call unintentional or accidental p-hacking, right? Which is people uh, essentially doing a lot of uh, different regressions and then choosing the one that happens to have the lowest p-value um, based upon some uh, vague arguments that it's slightly better than others. Um, this is a long conversation as well, uh, but I think I think having the journals have the ability to verify the data, I think it uh, helps. Um, to uh, uh, convince authors that both of these types of bad behavior shouldn't be done. Um, related to this, one of the main reasons why I wanted to do it is this point, who wants to be the only journal not requiring uh, the, uh, the data to be provided and to be verified? Um, if you are one of the remaining journals uh, not requiring this, it leads to selection dynamics that I don't think I have to talk about too much, but they are not in the favor of the journal. Um, 
So as more and more journals start to do it, it decreases the deterrent um, of people submitting because people should start accepting that they're going to have to deal with these issues anywhere. And uh, the few journals that uh, remain not doing this, well, those fraudsters, which journals are they going to choose? Um, so um, this is uh, definitely something to uh, um, um, think about. The last point I'll make is that um, it also is important to allow for verification of what generated results. So I'll mention uh, one paper that uh, we published at EI last year um, in which they um, had multiple different uh, research teams try to uh, replicate an existing paper by just giving them the data, giving them the question and say, go for it, right? Now, in engaging in any empirical work, there are a ton of uh, uh, decisions you have to make about what to do with the data, how to deal with uh, what appears to be mistakes in the data, how to deal with outliers, how to deal with things. And if it's not clear of what you've done with that, it's difficult for other people to know what you did and why they might have gotten inconsistent results from yours. Um, so this paper showed that uh, different research teams came up with uh, results, positive, negative, with um, uh, standard errors all over the board, even using the original data and research question of the researchers, because people made different choices about uh, what data, what they did with different data points. Having a record of that is important for other people to do this research. Uh, there was another paper that came through EI a while ago um, where some people were trying to uh, start off with someone else's estimation and build from there. Um, it turned out that the original paper had basically gotten a positive effect. This replication could only come up with a negative effect and then they tried to build off of it. And even though one of the uh, original authors was a referee on this paper, even they couldn't figure out why um, the other people couldn't come up with the same result. But if the original authors had posted their uh, scripts, posted their data, um, you know, it would have allowed for those following up to uh, make certain that they're starting from the same point. Okay, and in my view, in the long run, uh, these types of things are um, important for the integrity of our work and for um, scientific advancement. So I will uh, stop there um, and uh, uh, turn it over to uh, Tony. Good, Tony. Thank you, Tim. Mm -hmm. And uh, with okay. that, our last panelist, uh, Tony, you've got the floor. And I do. Hang on one sec. There we go. So I wanted to start with a little bit of a discussion about how this um, uh, issue started up in finance. We're a little bit behind economics. Um, it was first proposed in 2011, and all three journals summarily rejected this idea of code and data sharing. So that was at the end of it. In 2015, I was a part of a three journal group that was tasked with a proposal of coming up with a code and data sharing um, protocol for the JFE, the JF, and the RFS. We ended up punting on data sharing because a lot of finance data is both proprietary and very expensive. But we did come up with a code sharing policy and the American Finance Association approved a version in 2016. And the JFE editorial board dismissed the idea and so did the SFS council. And it was interesting to see some of the objectives. It, these are some quotes. This imposes costs on the researcher without any obvious benefits. While encouraging greater quality control is a worthy goal, I think there are already abundant incentives from the risk of losing one's reputation within the peer review community. This is draconian. Are there documented problems? I can't imagine anybody but me making sense of the code now. It is documented for people who have been working on it, but someone who comes up with, comes at it fresh requires lots of guidance. So there was an enormous amount of objections. I don't particularly find these arguments um, satisfactory and for many of the reasons that Tim said. But this isn't the end of the story. The RFS adopted the Journal of Finance Code Policy in 2020. At that point, I was also on a different AFA task force to discuss, to propose extending the Journal of Finance code sharing policy to data. And we came up with the um, data infrastructure proposal and then the pandemic happened and then 
I don't know what happened, but the RFS adopted the code policy in 2020. And I took over the JFE in um, July 2021. And that's the first thing I did is I adopted, I went one step further than the other two journals. I adopted a code and data policy. And so Lars asked me why. It's because I've wanted to do this for oh, 20, like 11 years. And it just, I finally got to do it. So we think reproducibility is important. Unfortunately, we don't have enough resources for in-house reproduction. I've um, looked at how much this costs and we can't do it given our budget. So we decided that code and non-proprietary data disclosure was a close substitute. So, but I think this discussion of the history uh, in finance brings up the costs and benefits of reproducibility. So as the other two panelists have emphasized, I think it enhances the credibility of science and it really benefits students. Students who can go look at code and data that have been disclosed, is are, it's enormously useful for them. I actually think also it benefits individual researchers by enforcing good research procedures. I certainly conduct research different than I did 30 years ago. I use GitHub, I use version control, I'm super careful. And I think that's good. I think we should teach our graduate students to do this. And I think all of us old farts should change our ways. Um, I think it does solve the problem of potential for unseen errors. And I think most importantly, it improves transparency. You can write a paper very clearly and there will be nobody who will be able to completely replicate your paper because there's a lot of decisions in the code. But if you replicate the code, that becomes in some sense an auxiliary text. And so I think it's great. These benefits don't come out with costs. It does consume resources. There's an, there is a um, argument out there that I don't find entirely unpersuasive which is that the important papers get replicated anyway. I'm gonna come back to that. An argument that I don't particularly find persuasive is that if there's code and data availability, people will go on fishing expeditions and try to harass people to give them gotchas. But all of this brings up something, the, the way I think of this is we have a public good and it's costly to produce. And so, should journal, who should pay this Pigouvian subsidy? It, we have a good, it's a, it's a good thing. Should it be the journals? But there are other alternatives. Should it be universities? Should it be granting um, agencies? And then how should the, big should this subsidy be? Should it just be code and data sharing and we should leave the reproduction to the profession at large? Should it be actual journal reproduction? Or should it be data and code verification? I'll come back to that in a bit because I want to explain exactly what I mean by that later. And then should the subsidy to apply to all published papers? So let me talk about that. Who should pay? It is expensive. I've costed this out. My original intention when I started, when I took over the JFE was to have um, somebody like Lars on hand. And I decided that that was way too costly and that we couldn't do it. So that was the end of that. And I think that is probably true for most journals. What about granting agencies? This is something that would certainly work in the physical sciences or the biological sciences because they all run off of grants, but in economics and certainly in finance, very few people get grants. What about universities? I think that's a real possibility because I think you could change the culture that this would be part of research. It's not just producing the paper, it's producing the paper plus something that could be, re could be reproduced. And so perhaps in the future, universities could be persuaded to take part in this. And then what should the subsidy be? Code, code and data, verification, reproduction. I think until there's a culture of reproducibility, I am in actually, I, I, if there were infinite resources, I would say that all journals should reproduce results. I think that would be a great idea, but I don't think that that is universally available. I also don't think that just code and data disclosure are enough because they're often ill-documented, they're missing. I have checked the 
the nine submissions of code and data that the JV have gotten so far because we grandfathered in all of the old submissions, but I can't do that forever. And then, as I said, reproduction is costly. It's also, and I think this is important, it's very um, costly for researchers without abundant RAs. I believe I've had an argument on Twitter with Lars about this. Um, I certainly don't have abundant RAs, and I'm at a pretty good, good university. And I think that this does impose costs on researchers that it, it magnifies the um, these funding differences between really, really good universities and less well-funded universities. And it's not obvious to me that we want to magnify that. So I am in favor of code and data verification. Is there a readme file? This is what I check. Is there an ex execution script? Is there data or pseudo data? Does it look like it could be used? And then perhaps the for many journals that can't afford this, the rest of the profession could be the reproducers. But I want to talk about one thing, other thing that I think is more important, which is secret data, which is a big problem in finance. And should journals use, discourage the use of secret data? I'm not talking about administrative data, like the census or commercial data, like CompuStat. It's not secret, it's just costly. I'm talking about data that your friend at the bank gave you. And I think that so, a different question that is more important for reproducibility is, should this use of secret data come with some sort of reproducibility requirement? Should we require authors that use secret data to have it be accessible on say an air-gapped computer if somebody wanted to try to reproduce it? And so I think that that is one of the bigger issues. And I'm done. Thank you, Tony. Um, and so thank you to all panelists for a, a really uh, interesting and covering a wide a swath here of, of what we're doing. Um, yes, I do remember our, our discussion on Twitter about the resources necessary. Um, and let me take the moderator's prerogative here. Um, and I, I kind of see the aspect of it's difficult to reproduce as part of that equilibrium. We haven't yet all upgraded our skill set. And to what extent can technology substitute for some of that? For instance, if you're submitting something, can we require that essentially we have a machine check that there's push button reproduce built to which then becomes trivial to do at some level? I'm going to right now put forward that can't possibly solve all the possible solutions and we don't have uniform ways of doing that. But I think it's something to put forward as is that something we want to slowly move to or not, um, because it would reduce the cost of reproducing, uh, reproducibility checking at, at, the, uh, at the journal level, but it might also not make it necessary because if it's also easy to do it, the journals will, uh, the universities will do it, the researchers will do it, et cetera. It might be a desirable equilibrium, not easy to move to. Mm -hmm. Comments from the panelists? Yeah, Lars, can I actually, I, I wanna make some comments on some of the issues that uh, Tim and, uh, and Tony raised. I mean, the, Tim kind of mentioned the, sort of the cost to the authors of actually uh, doing this and, and Tony mentioned this as well. But so at some level, I'm not really very sympathetic to the, that argument on, kind of on the, on the author's part. It feels to me a little bit like, suppose we were in an equilibrium where people wrote down theorems, but they didn't actually include the proofs. And they said, you know what, you need to trust me. It would be a lot of work to write the, the proof. And so you're making it more costly for me to write these papers and I'm going to send it somewhere else. We don't do that. We, we, we say, no, you, do, you, do need, you make a statement, you do need to have a proof. And so the same way you put in results in a paper, we want to see to the extent possible that these results actually are, are meaningful. And uh, you know, that does sort of at some you know checking that does come with a with a substantial cost. And for the, the econometric society, that, that was a big concern as well. So we actually had a discussion at some point whether we should charge the authors for for replicating their papers. And you know, the, the people didn't want to necessarily impose those costs, but you, I, we we discussed one version of that where we would make it voluntary we would allow the authors to choose between paying a fee to get the paper replicated uh, 
or not. But then the paper would be published kind of with a gold star saying this one actually was replicable. And this one, we don't really know what the numbers mean because we never, we never could check it. And sort of clear that if you if you were to do that, and we, we didn't go that in that direction, and I, I'm not sure I would be in favor of that, but if you went in that direction, it's sort of clear that the authors would be incentivized to actually do the replication because it would make the papers much more valuable and people would, would trust them. And it, the, the fact that these papers are in the end used for tenure cases, for appointments, people have a very strong incentive to make them as credible as uh, as possible, so I, th I think it's sort of clear that we need we need to go there. And yes, it, it does. You know, even without the cost of of the replication itself being put on the authors, making the code and the data available in that way puts a cost on the authors. But again, I think that's that's fine. We we've moved over the kind of over the longer term to a culture where people publish more and more papers. Uh, I think improving the quality rather than the, the quantity of the papers uh, would be readdressing that change a little bit. And anything we can do to improve the, the quality of what we actually publish, I think I think is incredibly uh, important. So uh, I feel that some of these arguments are a little bit the same as the arguments against uh, pre-analysis plans where, where people sometimes are concerned that this limits what they can do and it puts constraints on people. But if you made it voluntary and, and you saw, saw that some papers did have pre-analysis plans and followed them, that would make those papers more valuable. So, so very quickly, experiments without pre-analysis plans would be viewed as, as second rate. And so it's uh, this is a way of, of distinguishing high quality papers from, from lower quality papers. And I, I, my guess is that, that fairly, you know, that over the next 10 years, pretty much all the journals are going to insist on, on replicating things one way or the other, because it, uh, it, it's just gonna send a big quality signal. Tim? Well, so on the issue of how far to take the uh, code and data requirements, because that is an issue because not everyone has the budget to hire replication teams and things like that. Um, so what, uh, what we've done is I have a data editor who's responsible that, to verify that all the archives submitted match our requirements. He doesn't run the code, but he looks at it to verify that one could run the code if you have all the things and that it's well documented enough so that someone uh, could do it, which is still a substantial investment of time, uh, but it's what we're trying to do as a uh, interim solution between not requiring anything, letting people put up whatever they feel like and to the full um, um, uh, uh, checking that uh, Lars does. Um, different journals, you know, will have different abilities to uh, do these sorts of things. And hopefully over time, uh, this gets easier and more journals will be able to do the full computational checks, but uh, it is definitely um, a costly thing to do. So and that's I'll just note that we don't actually, actually run the code on everything because of the issue of secret or you know, typically not secret, but at least hard to access confidential data as well, which continues to remain an issue in lots of economics, and I imagine finance as well. So I, um, echoing Tim, I like the idea of data editors. I'm going to try to finagle a way to get that. I don't, I don't have the budget to do what Lars does, but I think that having somebody besides me go through and make sure that the data and code that have been disclosed look like they could function is really important because I've run into a lot of data and code at the journals that doesn't that does not function with no readme files with a data set that has one observation I think that it's important to make if if one doesn't have the budget to make sure that that at least some basic um, requirements are met and I also completely disagree with all the the um, arguments against. I just wanted to put them out there. <laughs> um, so 
I think one of the other questions, and this relates to a few questions we have in the panel to sort of uh, preempt some of those, is since we can't verify all uh, replication compendia, um, either systematically because we don't have journal resources or practically because we might not in a timely fashion have access to the data, what should we do? What do your journals intend to do when you get evidence of uh, radical incompleteness or factual incompleteness or factual incorrectness of the analysis that was deposited? So you mentioned you can read through and it seems plausible, but does it actually yield the results in the paper? You can only check if you actually get somebody to run the code. So at some point in time, somebody is going to come now that you have replication packages and going to say, this doesn't actually work. What do you do then? Tony first. So that hasn't come up. Um, other uh, yeah. things have come up. <laughs> other things have, because I only have nine. Yeah, that's right. Uh, that's why I'm, I'm saying right now you can, you can describe it as sort of in the, in the void, right? As a theoretical mm -hmm. concept. No, so this is interesting. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure what I would do and my co-editors and I have discussed this. And so we have been, um, the JFE has dealt with other things like potential plagiarism cases, which is pretty straightforward to deal with. You do a big investigation, you decide one way or the other. For that, I'm not sure what we would do. I would probably try to ask the Elsevier folks for money to hire a research assistant. And then to verify whether that's actually right. right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Tim? So um, like Tony, we don't have a lot of uh, uh, cases yet, but uh, this is one of the things that bedeviled me when I was trying to write up the policies because as someone who is a mechanism designer, I want to describe all of the things that can possibly happen from this when I'm setting up rules. And I don't know, basically it's now left as well, editor's discretion, the editor will deal with it. In terms of what the editor will do, it depends upon how big of a violation um, I mean, you know, uh, there's always the possibility of um, um, of withdrawing the paper in extreme cases. If it's just a case of well, the one of the figures doesn't quite reproduce properly, I'll just send the authors a, a polite email saying you might want to update it. But if it looks like they've uh, really done something bad, then you know one has to have the more extreme measures on the table. It's just. It's difficult to specify the exact procedures and the uh, remedies to them in advance, in my view. Um, I, I'm not ready to do that yet until I have some actual cases where there's been an issue. Rito, what have you guys thought about it? Well, so, so we, we are going to move to, to replicating things so completely. And my, my ex, uh, experience, so far, when we just had graduate students do some replications, is that most of the that few of the papers directly replicate, mostly because authors are are just not really very skilled in putting together replication packages. They don't really try them out, and so there's some files missing. They don't uh, things are updated in a way that the whole set of programs doesn't run. So. I'm actually very hopeful that in the long run, we're going to get to a situation you know, when people become more fluent in version control and, and using Git, GitHub, that we get, get in a much better state of the world where things will replicate much faster. But you know, I, I agree with, with them. If we you know, currently will still be pay, publishing papers that are not uh, uh, verified yet. And if it turns out, that but we do require people to post code. And if it, it turns out that the code doesn't replicate the things that we published, then we could do anything from just updating the code because they missed some files, or if the results really don't uh, don't don't seem if it turns out it's not really possible to to get to the results in any serious way, then then we could withdraw the paper. And, uh, that was something I was concerned with at some point. So now in the language, when you actually submit a paper, you make clear authors, submitters acknowledge that we do have the right to, to withdraw papers exposed if, if we think they're not, that there's mistakes in there. 
And so the, that would be the, the ultimate sanction, or we could publish corrections if we think that the results more or less hold up, but but there are important changes when, when people try to, to verify things. But I really would like to get beyond that and just not publish papers until they can, uh, can get uh, replicated. Well, to sort of throw in as sort of my experience from what I now uh, flippantly call experience from a thousand papers, you are going to find all sorts of cases where even if you have all the code and the data, the analysis runs for three months. Are you willing to wait that amount of time to actually run it, right? You're going to run into lots of cases with data where it might run on the synthetic data that you might require as part of the process, but it might not actually run on the confidential data because they didn't rerun it because it's difficult to access and things like that. So we're, you are going to run into all of those. And I, I can't sort of say uh, we have the solution because I'm not mechanism designed complete by Tim's criterion. We have a, a policy for small changes so you can revise your replication package. And I reach out to authors on a regular basis for that. We have not yet encountered a hard case where uh, we could not verify and the verifiers who ultimately get access to the data show that everything's wrong in the paper. We have not yet found that, but that's just a matter of time for it to appear is my guess. Uh, well, so so at some point in time, I, we will find that. Yeah, probably what I would like to do is, is have a footnote somewhere in the paper or a postscript where we say, you know, this is sort of the state of, of replication for this paper, yeah. where either we sign off saying, we replicated all the numbers in this paper, or there were, you know, there are some difficulties at a, to the point that we decided to to stop the process because it, if it took three months, we, we're not going to do that, or the data were confidential, and so we can't reproduce it. it. But here, here is what what the, the reader who would like to replicate these results should know. And that would just be yeah. part of the, the, the record for the paper. I'll note that that note about success or not of reproducibility is part of the manuscripts in the economic journal. So uh, uh, Juan Lul does put that into their format. Yeah, so I, I, I that's, think that, 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 seemed, that yeah. makes a lot um, of sense. Let me uh, uh, turn to some of the questions from the audience, maybe. Um, so one question that, that has come up um, that I think relates back to what a few of you have said about this kind of needs to flow into our graduate uh, education and replications are actually done out there. Um, I mean, that was part of our initial observation as well is that there's a lot of replications going on but nobody knows about them. Um, so from two uh, panelists, Stephen Eglin and, and Fernando Asis, uh, the uh, question about how to crowdsource reproductions in some fashion. There's a variety of resources out there. Uh, the Replication Wiki has been around for a while. The Social Science Reproduction Platform that I've been involved with is out there to record both positive and negative replications. As a minimal outlet, there's journals that will accept comments about successful or unsuccessful uh, replications as well. Um, but thinking of this as a graduate student activity, um, is this something where we need to move as a discipline to sort of more strongly uh, record all of these things that are going on all over the place and incorporate it as part of our graduate education? So Tony? I will say, oh, well, let's start with her. That's fine. Tony Go was ahead. nodding before Tim. Uh, I was started. nodding. Um, I think I'm the only empiricist in the panel. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so one thing that I have moved to is when I co-author with graduate students, I've been using GitHub for about four years now, is I teach them about version control and making sure that you can um, do everything that, it, that somebody else could do exactly what you did. I also have all of the stuff in my papers double coded so that, that, that to try to make sure that there aren't mistakes. And I think that um, having training like that, that is not just from an advisor to an advisee, but perhaps part of a, um, an applied econometrics class is a really good idea. Um, just to add to that idea, um, we've actually done sort of peer evaluation of code within classes a few times as well. So I really like uh, the effect of that as well as part of the class. 
And um, I noticed that in the chat, there was a comment from Maria Jones at the World Bank. My understanding is that they also do some of this on a sporadic basis, that there's peer review within the institution of the code. So I think that's an excellent idea. Tim? So I was going to point out that when we were discussing how to do the review at Economic Inquiry, people brought up the idea of uh, putting it out there for graduate students to uh, uh, review. And the idea of that, I think, is fine. It's just it's difficult to do it on a systematic and timely basis. So to take that into account in um, publication decisions. So like Guido says, the better idea is to have it validated prior to publication. Well, unless we want three year long lags, you've got to get those things done quickly. And if every journal is asking for a graduate student to replicate these things, that's a lot of graduate student hours and it's gonna be idiosyncratic and it's gonna be difficult to manage. Um, being able to put it on occasionally then, you know, certain papers get the stamp of approval and certain papers don't by randomness. I don't think that's uh, ideal either. Um, and so in principle, the idea of what the model we've gone to is putting the uh, code up there that allows any graduate students or anyone else to go and replicate it and then come back and tell us. So it's spot checking in that sense, and it's allowing for that, but it's not taking it into the publication process directly quite yet. Um, but, but I will definitely encourage uh, graduate students to be uh, you know, doing these replications when they can. You've been working with graduate students as part of this. Was that uh, some structured thing or just editors calling on their uh, graduate students to run some of the replications? Yeah, I, I was just working with individual graduate students uh, on, on, these, uh, on these, these issues. Um, can, I, can I actually also answer one other? There was one question. So about why don't, why don't the publishers pay for this? So we, you know, in the end, I think I think that's uh, there's costs in running a journal, and those are going to go up if we provide more services. It, uh, if we replicate the papers, that's that's going to have to come out of somewhere, and so so. At the Econometric, over, over the years, the Econometric has changed publishers uh, when they, they, they thought that was appropriate. But it, it's not the case that it's uh, this could just be charged to the publishers. Uh, somewhere, you know, the people who benefit from the journals need to uh, to pay for, for the, these things. And we, you know, at the Econometric, we work with, with submission fees and publication fees. And you could imagine making getting it out of the, the publication fees, but it does have to come come out of somewhere. Nah, whether that's, you know, you could also be direct uh, reviewing resources, uh, but it, it does have to come out of somewhere. Or you're gonna just get a lot of theory papers. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, I, so when I was thinking about this, I was thinking about, could I do this if I increase the submission fee, which for the JFE is already pretty high because we pay our referees a lot. Um, and I would have had to um, have an enormously high submission fee to pay for somebody like Lars and to have actual replications. And I decided that that was not going to be the best thing to do. So I put that aside. I mean, if I, I want to sort of put a frame on it, I guess uh, my, my, my overall budget is about, uh, let's say, twice what a normal editor would be paid, but that's for all eight journals that each have at least another eight co-editors. So in the overall budget of a journal, it isn't actually that much, I think, but I'm biased. Um, but, uh, the, you know, uh, is that part of the process of doing so? Uh, let me pick another question from the audience. Um, and I think Tim started to allude to this in the sense of we shouldn't really worry about it in equilibrium, but have replication requirements affected manuscript submission numbers? Now, I think for Tony, that's hard to say given that how, how long that is. Um, uh, uh, so um, I, I think uh, most of you guys have only started or not yet fully implemented it. The only data point that I have is from the early days of implementing the looser uh, data availability policies that the AA implemented and then 
many other journals uh, relatively quickly picked up on. There is some evidence that the one journal that didn't for a while had a bit of a surge of uh, submissions, but that petered out after some time. And I think the reputation effect then kicked in that, that um, all of you have sort of recorded before. Uh, so I, I don't, I don't think that. So, that, well, I can, a concern for you, Tim, or I can something? answer a little bit because we've had the policy in effect since last December. Um, and I don't notice any, there's no, there hasn't been any drop off in submissions this year. So, I mean, there's always the counterfactual. Could there have been more? I don't know, but there also could have been less. So it's difficult to enough? attribute causality. Yes, believe me, I have enough. <laughs> uh, far too many to have to look. But I, I, I don't think we've noticed any decline and uh, we don't really get pushback from um, uh, authors about the uh, policy. So I haven't gotten any complaints about why are you demanding this from me, so. But, but I, I think authors, when they submit papers, expect them to be fully replicable. I mean, nobody is, is, is writing a paper thinking that the numbers are really dodgy and they don't really know where they came from. They just may have been optimistic in, in how well they would remember exactly what they did and how to do the replication. But unless people are actually submitting fraudulent papers, which obviously is incredibly rare, if, uh, I think people nobody's going to object very few people are actually going to object and so i also saw no evidence of that i saw much more evidence when when we instituted a page limit where people did push mm -hmm. back occasionally and 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 said they might submit to other journals but with uh, with this I, I don't see any evidence that uh, that it affects anything I have no way of telling because there were so many things that changed when I took over that it's hard to know. Um, let me try and see some other questions from, from um, the thing here. Um, so one thing that came up and this goes again to having um, outside entities sort of assure this. I think it intersects a bit with the, uh, again, the, the idea of equity and, and is it going to be uh, grant funded or is it just the rich people? But the idea of an outside entity uh, certifying before you even submit uh, to the journal that uh, the code is reproducible. I mean, this can take many forms and we're actually gonna uh, pick up on some of these later on in the webinar series about uh, a reproducibility agency, Cascade is one of those out there that uh, has done this, uh, of journal or, or, or of university specific uh, mechanisms to do this. I know of a few of those that are out there. Um, they all cost money to some extent, but would this be something that, because it doesn't show up on the budget of a journal, would be of interest to, to journals in general? Uh, question to, to my panelists here. If somebody came with a reproducibility certificate from a university or from a recognized agency, would you take it? Yes. And for- I mean, for, I would no, still would want them to start? publish, I would still want them to put the um, yes. uh, archive yes. up there. So I'm not going to take it. Absolutely. Yeah. But I mean, I, I would love to see it. Um, but I think it would also take a while for uh, those private entities to um, earn the respect of the publication community. Mm -hmm. Because if I get a, um, a receipt from some random place I've never heard of. I don't know what they do to check it. I don't know who they are. Um, so it's going to take a while for those uh, entities to develop a trustworthy reputation, which um, could be an issue. If, if, the university, you, you if talk... the university of Michigan set up a reproducibility center, would you accept that? Probably, right? Probably. Yeah. Probably, but we would still want to know probably what they're actually doing. No, yeah. that's right. But and 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 I think that it would all it's always important to disclose the code and if possible data. Yeah, correct. But so, so like you were talking about at the submit the initial submission of a paper. Yes. And I mean I would also say that would be very costly account. because as you submit to multiple different journals, assuming you're not lucky enough to get accepted the first time, that you know the the code might change and you've got to do this with every submission as you change that could be very costly to do it at that point so i don't know that i would push towards that equilibrium but in some sense it would be nice 
Well, but if, if we if we get to the point that people write code that is directly sure. reproducible, then it shouldn't really be very costly. I, mean, sure. I don't know how these these places would work, but if they charge sort of by the hour, and I submit something that is just one push on the button and it and it replicates because I, I just do the coding very carefully, then that should be very, very cheap. Uh, so yeah. I, mean, I, I, I think just a big step is, is getting people to do the coding much more carefully than we all were taught yes. how to do in the past. I'm, I'm sure that uh, Christophe Perignon, who wrote me an email, uh, a Twitter message about this is too late for Europe is sitting there with a cognac right now and, and uh, thinking about his pricing model at Cascade. Um, unfortunately, we're at time. Uh, so I, I unfortunately need to cut off our discussion and the many questions that are still uh, in the chat and that we've collected there. Um, what we'll do is we'll actually send around the questions we collected from the chat to all the panelists and uh, we can address some of those in our write-ups of this um, as, as uh, a way to do this. Uh, so let me first uh, start by thanking all of my panelists here for having taken the time for this uh, very interesting discussion on the topic of journals and reproducibility. Uh, thank you, Guido. Thank you, Tim. Uh, thank you, Tony. Um, for all of those who joined late or could make it, uh, there, we will post this recording after some light editing for uh, to make it like slick and, and clean and all that um, afterwards. And uh, all the panelists are invited to write up a small text that we will be collecting over the course of the year on the uh, website. Um, uh, Alex, if you could just post the web, our website into the chat for everybody to see so that they can uh, reference that. Um, I wanted to uh, then uh, invite everybody to join our next webinar on October 25th, uh, same time, same place, on reproducibility and ethics, IRBs and beyond. Uh, I'll be uh, discussing uh, the questions of uh, data acquisition, of how to incorporate reproducibility right from the start, even when you're writing consent statements and all the other implications when you might not even have an IRB uh, with two wonderful panelists then. Uh, so join us again there. Um, Keep sending us questions and uh, thank you all.